In this session, we'll, we'll actually do a hands-on linear regression. Basically, this is going to be hopefully focused mostly on model fitting, and I won't get distracted and babble too much about the pre-processing, though I will a bit. But uh, the, the model fitting, uh, so basically, when you, when you do an fMRI experiment, assuming it's a task-based one, uh, you'll, you will design timing and stuff like that, stimulus durations, and then uh, you'll have a corresponding model for what, say, is an optimal uh, response or an expected response to all your stimulus classes. And then you'll fit this model to the data. That model can include the drifts or, or sinusoidal terms for drifts or uh, motion regressors, stuff, stuff like that. So you'll fit all, all, the, all, this, all these regressors in your model to the data, and then you'll get beta weights for the magnitude of responses to each one of these regressors. Um, understanding the timing and the creation of the model and the subsequent beta weights is, is perhaps the most fundamental thing to fMRI. I mean, uh, the, the pre-processing steps is, is just a sequence of steps of getting prepared to do this main step. And then for each, for each subject, you, you create your beta weights, uh, beta weight maps of interest, and then you take those to a group analysis and maybe you'll just do a t-test or something more complicated. But uh, getting these beta maps at the single subject level is something you'd like to understand pretty well. And that, that specifically means the model modeling that uh, Gong was just uh, covering. But we'll, we'll do more of a hands-on approach in this session. So Gong just talked about, uh, well, well, Daniel talked about using the AFNI viewer uh, interactively, and Gong talked about modeling the HRF with both fixed shape and variable shape. In this session, we'll uh, babble a bit about pre-processing and we'll, we'll, we'll do that more tomorrow as well, more detail tomorrow than today. Uh, and then we'll, we'll just briefly remind you of regressors and the design matrix and stuff like that, but Gang just talked about it, so we don't have to say much. And then we'll uh, actually look at the data and look at the model fit to the data and things like that. So we'll spot, spot check the original data just to see if it looks like it ought to if there aren't any glaring uh, artifacts in the data that we should be concerned about, at least that we notice, and then we'll, we'll play around with uh, the statistical thresholding and maybe do some clustering and stuff like that. So we're talking about this y equals x beta plus epsilon uh, equation, at least in the simple form for ordinary least squares. So um, this is solved at one voxel at a time. You may have done pre-processing to get here. You may have scaled your data, registered it, things like that, or not. But uh, at the regression point, at each voxel, we're solving this e equation. And right now, we don't care about our neighbors. Each voxel, voxel is independent. Uh, we have the, uh, the x matrix is our regression matrix. Basically, those are all time series that we think we might see in the data. They're good things or bad things, or we want to account for them, whatever. But they're things that we we want to we want to model in the data. Baseline drift, motion, regressors of interest, what have you. And the solving this equation part comes in figuring out that that beta vector. So that beta vector is just a scalar on each time series. How much of this? 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 Much of this? That's the beta vector magnitudes, how much of each time series was in this current voxels time series. And then epsilon is just what you fail to model. How much does your, the, so you fit your model as close to the data as possible and how, what do you miss? That's, that's the uh, epsilon time series. And the solution in an ordinary least square sense, again, is where the uh, sum of the squares of the epsilon terms is minimal. For this course, we'll mostly focus on ordinary least squares, but you can do the same analysis with the ARMA 1.1 model and 3D Remo fit uh, if you want to account for that, uh, uh, the temporal autocorrelation. Again, as, as Gong said, the, the beta weights are, are not biased with ordinary least squares, so you're okay just taking the beta weights to a group analysis. But if you want to, if you want to show statistics uh, uh, significance, like for single subjects, 
like some of the anim animal studies or if you have uh, patient populations that are rare and you can't do a group of these patients or whatever. Uh, for those, say, the T-stats at the single subject level to be accurate, then you'd rather uh, deal with one of the ARMA models. And if you want to do a uh, 3D MEMA in the group analysis, which is like the, the T-test, but you, you sort of weight each beta weight by its reliability, uh, then, then you want the, the re reliability measure, which is to say the uh, standard deviation of, of the value to be more accurate. But we'll keep it simple and uh, focus on 3D deconvolve the ordinary least squares here. So the data that we're looking at is just a very, very simple model. Uh, it's actually uh, a, a, a localizer task uh, from Mike Beauchamp when he was, I guess when he was, uh, he's still down in Texas. Um, but it's a speech perception. Basically you have these two types of conditions. Uh, events for these last basically one second and you may have a, uh, repeated events in, in kind of a block design. So um, it's, it's, here's Audrey speaking some simple words like cat or whatever and in one case the visual aspect of the stimulus is clear but the auditory aspect is degraded in some way and the other, uh, in the other case the uh, visual is degraded and the audio is good. So they're basic, they're both audio, they're both visual, but in one case, one aspect is degraded. Not softer or dimmer, say, but, you know, just uh, not, as sh not clear. So definitely we should see strong visual response to both of these, and uh, as well as auditory response. The experiment design, there were three runs. Uh, each run consisted of 10 randomized block blocks and uh, within one, this is say one activation block, there are basically 10 trials lasting 20 seconds, really 19 seconds. It's a one second event, one second off, one second event, one second off. So really uh, we're looking, that at, looking at it as if it's 20 seconds. Better to do 19 seconds, but we're not being that picky. Um, but it's really more of an on-off. But it, you could model the one-second things repeatedly. You're not going to get anything different. That, that's too subtle for the data. Plus, these are very strong responses, so uh, you don't have to work too hard. So, so we've got these 20-second events and then 10 seconds off, 20 seconds on, 10 off, and this is a fixation for the off period here. And, uh, and during a single run, um, there are five blocks of each condition pseudo-randomized across the, across the run. So uh, two anatomical data sets were collected for, for each subject and the reason two anatomies were collected is because they also were going to do a surface analysis so they took two anatomies, registered them, averaged them and that reduces the noise a little bit and so maybe the anatomical segmentation and surface creation was perhaps a little cleaner than just with a single one. Um, three runs of EPI data were collected uh, with 33 slices, 152 time points per run. So basically that same data that we started looking at in AFNI data 6 slash AFNI. The TR is 2 seconds, voxel dimension 2.75 squared by 3. Sample size 10 subjects. You'll never get a study published with 10 normal subjects, but uh, here this is just a demo and it's good enough because this data is really robust. We get a strong group response with only 10 group result with only 10 subjects. So data quality check. So this at this point uh, we'll all go to the the AFNI directory uh, in that in that same location and basically do this slide. So you can follow the slide on your own but I will also do it up here. We'll do the same stuff but depending on how how you prefer to work. So we'll CD under AFNI data 6 slash AFNI, the same directory directory we were in for the earlier classes, and then we'll just run AFNI there. So first CD to that directory, then just run AFNI. And then we'll follow the rest of the slide. So CD 
AFNI data 6 slash AFNI. And of course, after typing CD, I immediately type LS and reminded these are the same, exact same uh, data sets we saw earlier here. And then we can just run AFNI. So following along the si slot with the slide, it says to switch the underlay to EPI run one. So we'll just look at the first run of EPI data. Open an axial image window and a graph window and then pick the ideal. So let's do that. So in AFNI, so note that I've now hidden a couple uh, of the AFNI image windows. If you just click on the images, image buttons again, it will raise up those wim windows. If you lose a window and can't find it, you can actually right click on this and it will bring that, that window to this location. Not, not too important here, but once you get a lot of stuff open, it's easy to actually lose a window. In fact, it's easy to lose the main controller. So I'm looking at something here, where, which AFNI controller goes with this? I could have four AFNI controllers open. That will, I mean, hopefully that will happen to you because you're looking at a lot of data at once. For example, you can run AFNI and look at 10 subjects at once and open all of them if you feel like it. Anyway, so how do you know which controller this go goes with? You can right click on this disp button and that will, that will raise up if I can get on it. Well, let me hide it first. And that, that just raises it to the top. So anyway, so switch underlay to EPI run one now. So I'll click on the black underlay button over here in the right side of the controller and then switch underlay to EPI run one. We see it as 152 time points. And uh, open an axial image and graph. I guess uh, I'll leave my sagittal image open, but I'll close the coronal one. So we have an axial image window and a graph. And then let's all jump to the same location. It says jump to IJK 267024. So uh, earlier with Daniel, you jumped to an XYZ coordinate. So if you were all following fast enough uh, with that to, to get to the same location in the brain. This is similar, but it's jumping to IJK uh, indices. So you can do either. They, they'll have the same effect. But remember, IJK, actually, those are the indices into the matrix. So you've got 0 through, what was this, uh, 80 by 80? I think 80 by 80 by 33. So 0 through 79, 0 through 79, 0 through 32 are the indices, uh, the index ranges in the three dimensions. And so we're going to jump to 20, 26, 72, or actually 26724. So if I uh, right, so on an, in the image window, we can right click and say jump to, but we're going to jump to IJK. And actually there's an IJK underlay and an IJK overlay. They might be different. The overlay data set is generally resampled to match the underlay, but we're, we're not running into that, but still we'll just say underlay. So jump to IJK underlay, and now we can type in 2672 uh, space separated, 26 space 72 space 4. So just a reminder, in the, in the uh, image window there, uh, you may need to click on it to select the window, depending on. So for on my, on my laptop, I just move over a window, and it gets selected automatically. So you may have to actually click on the window to choose it, and then right click to, uh, to do the jump. And then we can hit apply or set. Uh, a little comment about that. You may actually want a mouse for this class because we use all three buttons, especially getting later in the class, um, all three. Uh, well, all three, I should say all three. My mouse at work has about 10 buttons on it, which drives me nuts too because I'm always clicking something that I don't want to click. But anyway, uh, we want at least a standard three button mouse would be helpful.
if you have one. But if you, if you know how to deal with it on your laptop, then you're good. My laptop actually has three buttons, so that's nice. We're all looking at the same location. So one, one thing that could vary between uh, my display and some of yours is um, which side we're looking at. If you notice right here, we're on the right side of the brain, but you might be on the left side. Again, uh, as Daniel mentioned, uh, this is showing left equals left here, but that's not actually the default in AFNI. The default is left equals right because Bob succumbed to the radiologist and that's, that's how he made the default for the radiologist. So usually the left side of the image is the right side of the brain, but in our .AFNI RC files we specify to have left on the left side. So, uh, so you may have a mirrored image depending on that. But hopefully everyone has the same uh, graph time series up here. Now getting, getting over to the quality check, um, there are a couple, a couple aspects to note. I'll, I'll just start with the most visually clear ones in the data. If you notice again at the beginning of the time series, the, re the red dot is way up here, but for most of the data it hovers down here. That, that's that pre-steady state uh, uh, data issue at, at the very beginning of the run before the magnetization reaches a steady state the signal starts off high and then it then it stabilizes um, we actually don't have the pre-steady state data that's why we only have two TRs that we end up deleting so we had we had to fake this but anyway it, it, it looks like a spike at the beginning so we added the spike at the beginning of the data uh, but then what's what's with this spike yeah, that, that's a motion spike. How would you evaluate that? Probably by looking at the sagittal image. But so if we click on that to put our red dot around there in time, we can use the left and right arrows to go back and forward in time and see if the sagittal image shows a head motion. So I'll click around that. I can actually, I actually happen to just hit the spike. But uh, let's look at a sagittal image and bounce back and forth in time. And yeah, so we see the head rotating. And basically that's the only spike in our, our the apparent motion spike in the data. This, uh, this subject is annoyingly good for class demonstration. They, they didn't move enough. We had to fake this too, actually inserted a two degree rotation into the data, so. It's a curse, it's hard to get good data. Subjects don't move enough. So. Anyway, that, that explains a couple of the spikes in the data. Um, clearly, oh, we didn't do the, uh, the ideal. So let's pick the ideal time series. And uh, to, to do that, the, there's this FIM menu in the lower right corner, FIM meaning functional imaging. FIM was used a lot in the early days. So this is a remnant of that. So if we click on FIM, we can pick our ordeal. So left click on the FIM button and then uh, click the top button that says pick ideal. And then we can use the, uh, the EPI run one ideal. And then hit set or apply. Remember we had two uh, conditions. Uh, audio, audio reliable and visual reliable, and they alternated. Here we just see one result. We, we put them together in one res regressor just for this very first, first part of looking at the data. But when we do the real analysis, we'll have this, this wouldn't cover one, it wouldn't have all the bumps in there and have half of them. So certainly this voxel looks like it, uh, it's, it's responding to our visual stimuli. So you, you've seen all this before. Let me make a comment. So there's this automatic scaling video mode in MM for a voxel matrix size. Let me just make a comment. You don't have to remember for these little graph shortcuts, you don't have to remember all of these shortcuts. Um, for, for the matrix size, we can click on this opt button in the lower right corner for uh, options. And you get a whole submenu here. And the first one is scaling. That's what we'll end up doing too. Uh, in, the, in the brackets there are the shortcut keystrokes for these various operations. So uh, typically we'd like to use the capital A for auto scaling. So as we jump around amongst the voxels, the graph is rescaled every time. By default, actually I don't know what the, remember what the default is right now. Maybe I'll bounce around a little and check. 
Yeah, so it's getting small. So it's not it's not rescale. Well, it's hard to say because there are spikes in the data. Spikes affect the scaling, and so it doesn't look good. But uh, if you if you set this to use the capital A, and I'll just show you if I type a capital A and look at my terminal window, now auto scale is forced off. So clearly it's on to begin with. I don't know when when we changed that. And if I type capital A again, it's a toggle. Now it's on. Anyway, that's a convenient thing. And I'll, I'll go back to an image window and right click and jump to IJK. And it still knows, the, it still remembers the numbers so I can easily jump back to where I'm supposed to be. And the other one, that matrix thing, if you don't remember typing cap upper or lowercase m, you can find it in the menu here. It shows the little in capital M there to go up and down in the matrix size. So see more voxels or fewer. It, it, it sometimes is nice to show many voxels in the time series window at once. You actually will sometimes see patterns in that, which suggests either uh, move motion or scanner artifacts, or even you can actually see the brain contours. Though that's a little less uh, interesting, given that we can see brain contours down here better. So preparing for data analysis, here, here you'll have to stop me if I babble too long. I can always quit at the break. That'll force me. Excellent. So uh, what pre-processing do you do before, does one run before the linear regression? So a long time ago, almost nothing was done, including uh, registration was perhaps the first thing. And registration was initially done just slice by slice. So in my, uh, so back in, back in those golden or bronze or tin days, I don't know how we call them, uh, you usually did not acquire axial slices. Because if you want to register slices together, and the subject, this is the most natural sub subject motion, at least for humans in the scanner. So, so when you do this, you're just, your axial slices are all over. And, and registering this slice to this slice makes no sense whatsoever, right? But so back then, you were more commonly acquiring sagittal slices. So now if, if the head rotates, at least they're staying in the same slice for the most part. They can still move a little bit, but they do that less. And now at least slice-based registration does something useful. Nowadays, we don't, we don't usually bother with the individual slices, though you could. But uh, we generally just assume a rigid body. And if the subject dur does this during a slice, they're screwing up the data. We're not going to recover from that anyway. We'll probably censor it if it's a big motion as well. But in, anyway, so over time, uh, more and more pre-processing steps were added. You know, we, we should deal with motion. We, uh, maybe we can deal with uh, outliers, temporal outliers in the data through despiking or time shifting, volume registration, masking, blurring, blurring was just chosen to be done at some point in time. Scaling the data was just chosen to be done. You know, these are all steps that are incrementally added on to processing. But let's just uh, go through them to some degree. And note that when we talk about basically any steps you perform in the analysis, uh, you know, the, the, uh, a question people ask a lot or, or expect an answer to a lot is, so, so what's the best way to do this? We don't know. We don't know what the best way is. There, you know, we don't have a measure to tell you what the best way is. Uh, so all you can do is is understand what you're doing to a reasonable degree and decide if you feel this is good or if you feel something else should be done, and you can justify it. So uh, every step in here, people will you can bicker with people for hours or weeks about. So, uh, but you have options. So first, first of all, you might look for outliers. Um, we, we define an outlier as, like, for a single, a single voxel time series, you've got some trend, some drift going on, and maybe you've got some spikes in the data. The spikes are going to be outliers. How do we define an outlier? Well, 
you take the you take the trend and then you measure the absolute deviation from the trend at each time point and then you compute the median or 3d t out count or 3d d spike will compute the median of of these mean ab, uh, the mean median absolute deviation from the trend and then based on that at e go go back through the data and then at each time point how many median absolute deviations am I from the trend? So, and then if you're many of them, you'll count it as a spike. If you're not, you won't. So a person who moves more, their median absolute deviation will be higher, right? So it's, it's relative to the, old, that, uh, the actual data, how spiky, you know, what is a spike? So uh, 3T out count will, will tell you how, um, what, what time points seem to be outliers for each voxel. And if you put that in a different direction, at each time point, you can determine how many voxels within the brain are outliers, which is to say what fraction of the brain do I have as outliers at each time point. So in, in AFNIPROC, for example, you can use that measure for censoring. Uh, that's actually a very good uh, metric for determining what is, uh, when does the subject move. If they have a lot of outliers, they probably moved. And this is actually much more clean than the volume registration parameters give us as a measure for motion. Some people use it, some people don't, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an option. Uh, 3DD spike will, will hammer those spikes down for you. They will hammer them down anything between uh, two median absolute deviations and, and infinity is hammered down to between two and four. So spikes are still spikes, but they're just small ones. Why do we care so much about spikes? Well, a lot of the, uh, even the pre-processing steps and certainly the linear regression, you, you do things with uh, minimizing the uh, sums of squares of differences. So a spike is, is, is a killer. Spikes are very detrimental because if you're dealing with sums of squares, a spike gets squared before its effect is applied to a, to a time series or a volume or something. So uh, spikes really affect all the analysis steps. So sometimes reducing them ahead of time uh, makes things go uh, a little more robust, say. Uh, then, you, then you might do time shifting with 3D T-shift. Oh, I can select this, huh? Uh, 3D T shift, remember uh, you're acquiring perhaps slice 0, 2, 3, 4, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and then 1, 3, 5, 7, 9 in an interleaved manner. Um, but that means you're going to create regressors based on having a stimulus at time 17.3 and another stimulus at time 41.6. Uh, within one volume, uh, this voxel versus this voxel are basically a whole TR apart. This voxel versus a neighboring slice voxel is half a TR apart. So maybe you want to adjust, uh, adjust the timing so that it's as if the whole volume were collected at the beginning of the TR. And then the timing for the volumes would match your regressors more precisely. Or you could do things to the middle of the TR Whatever, whatever suits you. Uh, but say the, the, the way we typically do, this, do things with uh, AFNIPROC, say, is to use uh, 3D T-shift to resample the uh, temporally interpolate to the beginnings of the TR. So you've got your, your data going on. You're going to do a temporal interpolation to shift it back by 0.7 seconds to, so that time points are at the beginning of, beginnings of the TRs. Some people do that. Some people don't. Um, do you have to do something special for 3D T shift to handle uh, multiband? Not, not, not really. A multiband uh, acquisitions. I don't. I don't really. S I haven't noticed anything special about multiband acquisitions in terms of the analysis, except for the fact that it has a faster, a shorter TR. But uh, so you're you're acquiring data in a shorter period of time, possibly, uh, you know, multiple slices at, at once here. As long as, the, as long as you know when you acquired each slice, you can still use 3D T-shift to shift them appropriately to the beginning of the TR. 
faster acquisitions what might have a bigger impact on whether you do band passing or something, which I think is a bad idea in any case. But uh, if, if your TR is shorter than band passing, both makes more sense and much, much less sense, and both at the same time. So I'll, I'll whine about that later. Um, so, so after those steps, you might go into a, a registration phase here. 3D Valreg is what we use to uh, register EPI data's uh, EPI volumes to one base EPI image. Uh, we might actually use the outliers from the first step to determine a time point that clearly doesn't seem to have any motion in it, because the outliers are the outlier fractions are are very small there. So we if we use that as a volume registration base. Since the subject did not move, then it should be a fairly robust one. If you happen to choose some random time point, like the, even the fir very first one or what have you, then the subject could have moved during that volume acquisition, and now you're aligning everything to a bad volume, and you know that can't be good. You align all the EPI data together, and then you might run align EPI in at.py to align the suspiciously named EPI and anatomical data. Uh, together. In the uh, in the tin days, we weren't very we weren't good at this. We've only gotten good at this. What was it? Five years ago, perhaps six years ago. My sense of time is not I seven. seven. I was within the decade, so that's not bad. Uh, we we didn't used to be good at that, but now now we're pretty good at it. So uh, in the earlier days, how did we align the EPI and the net? Well, you, you acquire the anatomical volume, and then you acquire your EPI data, and you align all the EPI data to the first EPI time point, maybe after, after steady state or not, yes or either way possibly, but probably afterwards. And how did you align the EPI data to the anatomy? Please don't move, please don't move, please don't move. And then, then you're done. So what happens if the subject moves in there? Mm, tough luck. You know, you, you, might, you might try to manually align uh, the the anatomy to the EPI, uh, we have we have pl a plugin for doing that. How good are, are we as humans at doing this three dimensional registration and finding a good one? We're not very good. We can we can come you know we won't fail miserably. We won't have a gross failure, but we're not going to do a good job. But anyway, so now now we're pretty pretty good at that. So we don't have to choose an EPI volume that's temporally uh, close to the anatomical one. So even in some case, cases, you won't bother to acquire an anatomical volume for a scan. So like the subject was just scanned in the morning, we, we got an anatomy, and now would they scan them again in the afternoon, we might not bother with, that, with the time it takes to acquire a new T1, because we can, uh, we can align them. Then you might, uh, you might register your, uh, your anatomical data set to your template whatever template you're using. Um, AutoTailorAc is, is the, the program we currently use for affine registration, affine being uh, you know, the, the shifts, uh, shifts and rotations plus scaling plus shearing. Mm, that's a shear. So uh, the, these affine registrations will account for those types of, of uh, uh, transformations or there's auto warp.py, which will uh, do a nonlinear registration. And our version takes the data set, it breaks it up into smaller and smaller boxes. It registers all these boxes, and then it goes more fine and registers all those boxes, and they overlap, and then it gets smaller and smaller. So uh, Daniel will, will chat about that. That's uh, in 3D Q Warp. But that's the nonlinear registration. So you can choose, choose either of these. Nonlinear registration, if it works well, it's harder to do well. Well, I should say it's easier to have subtle mishaps in nonlinear registration because every part of the brain is basically registered somewhat independently. So you can have weird things happening here when it's nice over here, and, it, and, it's, and you have to look harder for, for issues. But, um, but typically, you get much better group results with nonlinear registration because you have better anatomical correspondence across subjects. 
now we've done we've done these multiple registration steps and there are there are other registration steps we might do too um, um, distortion correction maybe with uh, multiple phase encoding there there are a lot of a lot of uh, registration steps you could really apply, but what we typically do in AFNI proxy is we, we concatenate our registration. So we don't do this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, and now we've resampled our EPI data four times. And it gets blurrier and blurry and blurrier every time you resample. So what do we do? We concatenate these transformations together and then it's only applied one time to the EPI data and you just get the one resampling and your data is more like the closer to the original resolution, a little bit less blurry than it, it would otherwise be. Then you blur the data. Um, I'll just uh, mention that briefly too. Why, why would you intentionally blur the data? Uh, two reasons. One is basically uh, the the one, one simple aspect is noise cancellation. So you've got, you've got uh, voxels that are near, each, near their neighbors in space. For the most part, we, we hope that they have similar uh, bold signals, at least in, in areas that are responsive to our tasks of interest, you expect similar bold signals. So what happens when you blur them a little bit together? Well, you hope that the signals reinforce each other and that the noise cancels. Uh, if, you, if you average white noise, pretending and hoping this is white noise that we have here, that should go towards zero as you, as you average it. So that's one reason to blur. The other reason to blur is if uh, for uh, 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 temporal var uh, spatial variance in the anatomical structure across subjects. So uh, in, say, in two subjects, or in many subjects, you've got uh, responses in this exact same lobe. And so this subject has a response here, the subject has a response here, but the lobes aren't perfectly overlapping. So blob, blob, blob. What happens when you blur? You make this blob bigger, this blob bigger, this blob bigger, and now you get better overlap across your subjects and a better group result. That was more important when we did affine registration to the template. Now that we're getting better registration through nonlinear uh, methods, you get better group you get bread, better anatomical correspondence across your subject, and it, it reduces the need to blur for that, um, for that overlap reason. So that, that's beneficial. Masking, uh, you can create masks with 3D auto mask. Um, we don't actually uh, generally recommend applying any mask uh, to the EPI data at the first level analysis time. We'd rather, uh, we, we want to see the whole result, in, including if you have blobs of so-called activation out in the middle of nowhere. You wanna, want to understand this. Uh, if you see something, you want to know, is it just a ghosting artifact or is it something I should be more concerned about? Uh, in what case might you be concerned? For example, uh, some people did a full analysis. They had their they had their pretty pictures. They're writing, uh, trying to write up their result and submit this as a paper, getting close to that point. But they they just aren't quite sure about why the uh, activation say is in the in the areas that it is in. So they in this case they sent their data to Bob. I don't remember if we looked how many of us looked at the, at that time, but. They sent their data to Bob and asked him to look at it, and he just ran the analysis in AFNI, and lo and behold, it was quite clear, they had activation all over, all, all outside the brain, but uh, like following the contours of the brain. But they didn't, couldn't tell that because they were doing a masking step. So what, in what case would you see activation along the contours of the brain? That's just motion. Almost always, it's just motion that's correlated to your stimuli or to your uh, ideal curves, say. So then you get then you get what looks like activation all over, it is, but it has nothing to do with uh, blood flow or, or or anything like that. And you're about to publish a paper on this, so you uh, instead of having to retract anything, you'd rather look at the full result and see, oh, this is this is a motion issue. What can I do about that? 
we don't t really mean to be all uh, doom uh, doom talking here, but it's it's good to understand what types of problems you'll run into rather than just run a simple analysis and look at the pretty results, right? So the 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 goal is to understand things well enough to detect what what seems to be an anomaly that you might uh, might have to deal with. And then the last pre-processing step is temporal mean scaling. At least that's what we do. We scale every voxel to uh, a mean of 100. Uh, and, and again, if we'd, we'd perhaps rather scale it to uh, uh, the, the baseline being 100, which is, isn't very hard to do. We get baseline terms out of the uh, linear regression. But it's just a little bit harder and basically unnecessary. Because the, even in a voxel that is very, very responsive to your stimulus conditions, a big, a big percent change is like, uh, like a 3%. That's a big per signal change it, because of a uh, bold response. If you, and, and so the average of that voxel could be, say, 1.5% percent more than the average of the mean, of the baseline. So the, the pure mean is 1.5 percent above the, uh, the, the, the uh, baseline. Is that, is that concerning? No, that would change a beta weight of, of, of 1 to a beta weight of 1.15, 1 1.015. So it, it's a 1.5 it's a percent change on the beta weight, not additive, but of, of the magnitude itself. So basically, you'll nev you'd never notice this. So it's, it's not worth the little effort. But you could. We demean our uh, motion parameters um, for that reason. And so I think basically uh, all of our, I think most of our regressors of no interest would be demeaned, in which case the baseline is, is reasonably estimated. But again, if you make a mistake with that, it's not worth it. Not worth the concern. The auto of the spatial normalization is it doing in slice or the the all all of the normalization steps that we do is ba are basically three D uh, transformations. Yeah. So the one the the the, the old, I mean, there's old two D two D imrig. Yeah, I mean, like those ones you can choose. Like some are like in slice. Yeah, two two D imreg is a slice wise uh, registration. So if you use the auto warp, it can only do. Can it choose to do in slice like three, like two two D or just three? It, it depends. Uh, like, so if you're collecting data where you expect it to be fairly rigid and uh, not to move out of plane. There, there. It's. It would not be unreasonable to run the 2D imreg on on that, uh, but it, it's a little. It's a little dangerous because, you know, I don't. I don't know which slice direction you would go after, to to expect the whatever subjects or whomever you're scanning not to move out of plane because moving out of plane is a problem for that. But even if they don't move out of plane, uh, s some of the some of the slices. Like suppose it's one slice is more or less circular. How do you align two slices? Well, y in the same place, but you you could you could rotate this one hundred seventeen degrees and it might still align, and so you have to worry about things like that when you're doing slice wise registration, even if it, you know, even if they don't move out of plane. So there there are things to to worry about, but you can do two D registration and you can even do three D registration after that. But uh, it's easy to have little problems with the 2D. Yeah, just sometimes we do red, and then you know they are not moving, but animals are very on their size, so mm -hmm. the green is very. So some are more interior, they look small, but actually they didn't move the other uh, axis wise. Mm -hmm. So if I do 3D, it just shifted to another uh, uh, size, so, so it's moving on the axial directions. It's sort of a register in a wrong way. Yeah. So that's why I, I think I have a choice of uh, choosing either 3D or 2D. And, and you can do both. You know, some people have done that. But you just, you just have to be careful not to have some, something go wrong because it's easy. Mm. 
Other questions about this? Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm studying stroke patient, do I like have an extra step to implement lesion? Uh, that that that's certainly harder if you've got uh, you know if you're missing pieces of of a brain or something like that or um, the way the best way we've we've expected to work but we haven't spent that much time evaluating these things is you can you can actually apply a mask to to tell some of the programs to ignore this area of the brain and now perform a registration and and just to pull this area along with whatever else is done so sometimes that is helpful if if this one area is going to distort the results in some way um, but because uh, because that might do a pre and post if uh, uh, registration if you have such data I don't know if you do but even to a template it's it's a similar thing you, you may want to mask out any part of the brain that you think would di distort the result in a bad way are you aware of any code doing that in people have done that I don't know how successful it has been Daniel probably knows so, more uh, we have a that we wrote for stroke uh, alignment. Uh, and the, one of the problems with stroke lesions is that they're so large that virtually anything that works with nonlinear alignment just won't work. It won't work with stroke. So uh, uh, on, the, on the stroke lesion side, on the non-lesion side, everything works. So one solution we had uh, for this affine alignment made a perfect brain by mirroring the non lesion side and then have my registration. So I can have people writing the script. Okay, so uh, let, let's let's take a ten minute break and then finish up afterwards. <laughs>